Question one, multiple choice. Let's start with 1.10. So let's take a look. Which of the following statements is or are true for the photoelectric effect? The photoelectric effect demonstrates that. And then Roman figure one, light has a wave nature. That is not the photoelectric effect. That is diffraction, right? Where we talk about split ring and so on. Used to be a topic in grade 11. So that is how we demonstrated that life can also behave as a wave. In photoelectric effect, we are demonstrating that light can behave as a particle. So Roman figure number two is correct. So we like those options that have Roman figure number two. And then Roman figure number three, light energy is quantized. Is it? Yes, it is. We can quantify it because how are we able to calculate uh, the frequency of light, right? Uh, the energy of light, if it is not quantized. So, Roman figure number three is also something we're interested in. So, two and three, those are our answers. And that looks to be option D. So, there we go. The, the answer to 1.10 is D. And then 1.9 the diagram below shows a simplified electric model. The rotation of the coil is observed from the battery. The rotation of the coil is observed from the battery. Uh, that is key right there. And then which one of the following statements is correct while the motor is in operation? The coil and the mm, right? And then we have a few options there. If you look at option B, and option A, they talk about slip rings, right? And if you look at the sketch, we clearly don't have slip rings. So A and B are already not possible answers because they talk about slip rings. And what we have is split rings or commutators, right? So A and B is already not correct. So we are only looking at C and D. Commutator rotate clockwise, that is C commutator rotate anti-clockwise that is d we are looking at 1.9 so let's go through the question statement again to make sure that we are not missing anything the diagram below shows a simplified electric model the rotation of the coil is observed from the battery so let's take a look at our battery we have the positive charge over here oh, not the positive charge but the positive end and the negative end and then the current flows in this fiction right so what can we do we can use a uh, what do we call this we can use the left hand rule we can use the left hand rule because we have an electric motor right and then with our index finger we must point from north to south and with our middle finger um, we must point at uh, the direction of the current right so now you must have your thumb pointing downwards of which the thumb shows you the direction of the force of the coil right so the the coil is going downwards at this end it is going downwards at that end right so it is rotating in an anti-clockwise fashion so that is why the answer to 1.9 is supposed to be d the commutator rotate anti-clockwise that is 1.9 and then 1.8 the kilowatt hour is a unit of what is the unit of power which is option a that is what what is the unit of electric current that is ampere what is the unit of electric energy of electrical energy mm, not quite sure and then the, uh, the unit for potential difference is volts we know that so in doing that we have eliminated the answers that are not correct and we are left with the correct answer which is electrical energy 1.8 so 1.7 two small identical spheres each with mass m and charge plus q are placed in a vertical cylinder the spheres remain stationary when their centers are r meters apart as shown in the diagram below ignore all frictional effects which one of the following expressions can be used to correctly calculate the distance r okay so the spheres are stationary right so if you look at this sphere up here m right 
if it is stationary it means that its weight and the electrostatic force exerted by the sphere at the bottom of the cylinder should be equal to each other hence it is stationary right so we can say weight is equal to electrostatic force so what is the weight the weight is mg and then what is electrostatic force k q1 q2 over r squared but these spheres have an identical charge so we have mg being equal to k q squared over r squared we want to find an expression for the distance the radius so we're going to have r squared being equal to k q squared divided by mg if we take square roots on both sides r is equal to the square root of k q squared not q2 but q squared divided by mg that looks to be option a so that is the answer to 1.7 1.6 the absorption spectrum of an element surrounding a moving star is observed on earth and found to be red shifted which one of the following combinations is correct for the movement of the star and the frequency of the observed light on earth so it is red shifted we already know that it is moving away so these are the only two options that you are looking at and then frequency of observed light on earth so the frequency of the observed light on earth should have decreased right from that which is emitted because the star is moving away and we have a redshift so that is option a so right the star is moving away and the frequency observed of observed light on earth should have decreased relative to the frequency that is emitted at the star that we are interested in 1.6 option a 1.5 which one of the following combinations below oh well <laughs> that's not the question the question says well that is the question but the question statement says a ball falling vertically downwards from point a strikes the ground with velocity v and bounces reaching a maximum height at point b as shown in the diagram below which one of the following combinations below is correct for the direction of the impulse of the ball upon striking the ground and the magnitude of the velocity with which the ball leaves the ground direction of the impulse on the ball so the ball strikes the ground and it ends up going up right so the impulse is upwards right so that is easy to deduce we are only now looking at a and c we are no longer interested in b and d so let's see if uh we need to get rid of one between a and c so let's go ahead and look at the other uh, column that we have magnitude of the velocity with which the ball leaves the ground is it greater than v or less than v what is v again a ball falling vertically downwards from point a strikes the ground with velocity v and bounces reaching a maximum height at point b so it is less than v it is less than v so we have less than v as uh, the option in s um, as an option in c right so c should be the answer right that ball leaves the ground with a velocity uh, that is less than uh, that which it strikes the ground with right uh, we can see that uh, it doesn't go anywhere close to reaching the point at which it originated from uh, that is 1.5 let's take a look at 1.6 a force f acts on a box as the box moves from rest down a rough incline at a constant acceleration so constant acceleration not velocity but constant acceleration so we still have some f net the forces are not balanced right so don't let the word constant throw you off right it is constant acceleration not velocity so we still have an f net which is non-zero the force is parallel to the incline as shown in the diagram below choose the option that correctly completes the flowing statement the work done by the gravitational force is mm, the work done by the frictional force and the work done by the force f well i feel like i need a free body diagram here in order for me to see exactly what is going on yeah it seems like there's a lot going on free body diagram would definitely help so let's see how we can um sketch that free body diagram right so 
and there we have our dot right and then what do we do now let's start with the force f so this is the force f pointing up the incline and then this is um the parallel component of the gravitational force right because that is the one that is going to be uh, doing uh, work the what do we call this one the perpendicular component is not going to be doing any work so that is the parallel component and what else do we have um let's see uh, the parallel component uh, in which direction is our object moving is it moving up the incline or is it moving uh, down the incline let's see the object is going down the incline right uh, it moves from rest down the incline so the frictional force should be up the incline so we have um the frictional force uh let me write that the frictional force uh the force applied and the parallel component of the gravitational force right and our object is still moving down the incline at a constant acceleration so what does that tell us that tells us that fg parallel is greater than f applied plus the frictional force that is the only way it can move downwards at a constant acceleration right if it was moving downwards at a constant velocity it would imply that fg is equals to fa plus fr but it is moving at a constant acceleration but how does that relate to work well they are moving over the same horizontal distance right we don't know what delta x is ultimately but del uh, but delta x is the same for fg parallel fa and fr right so that does not affect us with anything right and then we then have the one remaining thing which is cos of um zero for fg parallel and cos of 180 for force applied and uh, the frictional force but uh work is a uh, scalar right we don't care about um uh, the direction actually so we are only interested in the magnitude here right the magnitude of the work done so the work done by fg parallel should be greater than the work done by fg or not fg but uh, force applied plus the work done by the frictional force it should be greater than the sum of that of those two so which option corresponds to that the work done by the gravitational force is greater than the sum of i'm looking at option c because it seems like it makes sense is greater than the sum of the is greater than the sum of the work done by the frictional force and the work done by force f i'm going with option c here yeah. it is greater than those two it should be greater than those two uh, because the distance is the same and um the object is moving in, uh, the distance is the same and we are only interested in the magnitude okay and then 1.3 a ball moving horizontally has constant momentum p and kinetic energy k the ball collides with the wall and bounces horizontally immediately after the collision the ball has momentum half of p the mass of the ball remains constant which one of the following is the kinetic energy of the ball immediately after the collision so let's take a look uh there's two ways we can calculate this but we're just looking for the right option we don't have to uh, do any rigorous calculation so let me show you what i'm looking about so we know that initially p is just equals to mv right and then ek is just equals to a half mv squared so let's take the initial mass as m but it's not going to change it's going to remain as m and the initial velocity as v right so here we have v it does not change but after after the collision we have a half of p if the mass is a half of p why, why am i writing that uh, like that we have one over two p right so if the mass remains the same what is causing p to now be a half the velocity needs to be a half for p to be halved if the mass remains the same so our let's say v final is equals to v right over two 
it is half uh, the initial uh, velocity that you started with. So how will that affect the kinetic energy? Let's find out. 1 over 2 m and then we have a half of the initial velocity. So ek is equal to a half m and then we have v over 2 squared. So that is going to be v squared over 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. Why am I thinking about that? So we have ek being equal to 1 over 4, right? I've pulled out 1 over 4. And then we are left with a half mv squared. So it will be easy to see that this is 1 over 4k, which is option A. Right. And then 1.2. A stone thrown vertically downwards from the top of the building takes t seconds to strike the ground. Consider the acceleration time graph below for the motion of the stone. What does the area, what does the shaded area from zero to t, uh, from zero and t show in the graph, shown in the graph uh, represent? Okay, so let's see how we can uh, make sense of that. So a stone is thrown vertically downwards from the top of a building with some velocity that we do not know, right? And it strikes the ground at time t. Consider the acceleration time graph. So what will this area represent? We don't know the initial velocity, right? Uh, a says the final velocity of the stone. It's just not the final velocity of the stone because look at this. Vf is equal to vi plus a delta t, right? So a delta t, a multiplied by delta t is what the area under this graph is going to give us, right? So, does a delta a multiplied by delta t give us vf? No, it does not, because vi is not zero. If vi was not zero, it would give us. If vi was zero, it would give us vf. But this is not the case. And then b says the change in position of the stone. There is no position that we can they come up with or we can deduce from this formula, right? And then C says the constant velocity of the stone. A delta T is not the constant velocity of the stone. It's not easy to see from that formula. And then D says the change in velocity of the stone. So take a look at this. Vf minus Vi is equal to A delta T. So the area under the graph does indeed gives us uh, the change in velocity of the stone, 1.2. And then 1.1, 1 .1, several forces are acting on... And on a moving object, right? Which one of the following statements is correct when these forces are in equilibrium? The velocity of the object is increasing. We know that not to be true. The object is moving in the co at a constant velocity. The forces are in equilibrium. So it makes sense for the object to move at a constant velocity so that the acceleration can be zero, right? Right. And then the kinetic of uh, the kinetic energy of the object is decreasing that is not correct the object has a non-zero acceleration that is not correct clearly the answer is b to 1.1 there we go